Oh, it must be amazing being a Christian. You know, having God in your back pocket, having the Lord of the universe at your beck and call, never having any problems, and always getting what you want. Amazing. It must be amazing being a Christian. Well, actually, it doesn't, doesn't work like that. You see, God wants much more for us than giving us good health and, and wealth. Oh, 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 well, then I'll... I'll try something different then. Uh, what, what's the point if he won't give me everything I want? Perhaps that's an imaginary conversation. Perhaps it's not. Uh, perhaps it's a conversation that we're actually tempted to have with ourselves when God doesn't answer our prayers the way we want. You know, why hasn't God answered my prayer? Well, maybe it's not all true, everything the Bible says. Or maybe there is no God. Or maybe there is, but he just doesn't love me the way that he said he does. Maybe he doesn't really care. Because I've been praying and praying and praying, and it hasn't worked. It hasn't worked. Have you caught yourself saying things like that? Because, you know, that's the point of prayer, isn't it, right? That's what we think, don't we? Tell God what I would like and then have him agree and give it to me. Often we act and we pray as if that's exactly what we believe prayer to be. And too often we will turn to this passage before us to validate that idea. That if we just keep praying, keep asking, then God will give us exactly what we seek. Is that what this is all about? Let's have a look. So we come to this second part of Jesus' teaching on prayer. The second part of Jesus' answers to the question, teach us how to pray. Last time we looked at what we call the Lord's Prayer. And we learned that prayer is not about changing God, but about changing us. And we were reminded that prayer isn't magic. It's not about getting God to do what we want. And yet, doesn't it seem to be exactly what this passage is saying? Persevere in prayer until you get what you ask for. Maybe we've been told in the past that that's exactly what this means. See, Jesus starts with this slightly funny story about a man who has visitors arrive at his house late at night. And because hospitality is such an important part of their culture, he wants to give them some food to eat, but he hasn't got anything. So he goes to his neighbour, another friend, to borrow some bread. And his friend's like, just buzz off, I'm sleeping. You know, I've just got the kids down. If you wake them up, I'm going to kill you. Yeah? <laughs> Leave me in peace. And Jesus makes the point in this little parable, this little story, that even if this guy won't get out of bed and help him because he's his friend, if the guy keeps knocking on the door, he will surely, eventually give him what he wants, even if it's just to shut him up. And so then Jesus says in verse 9, I tell you, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and it will be opened to you. So Jesus is saying, this story is about how you should pray. Pray like this man. And so someone will say, make the application, see, God is saying, if you bother him enough, he'll give you what you want. But that's being quite tone deaf to the context of this parable. You see, this is an illustration about how we should pray it's not a parable about how God will answer or what God is like, right? And that's really, really good news because I hope, certainly, the God that I know from Scripture is not like this reluctant friend who will only help us if we annoy him. You see, this friend wasn't helping out of love for his friend. He was helping to serve his own purposes and would have probably given him anything at that time of night just to get some sleep. No, the context of this parable is our persistency, our continuing in prayer. There's a, a, a body who doesn't even care about you. If you persist enough, he will eventually give you what you're looking for. 
And so what it is saying is that if that is true of the average person with a friend, how much truer is it of God who loves you and cares for you perfectly? He's saying that your persistency in calling out to God will bring you goodness. And so what Jesus is saying is that the benefit of prayer is found in persistency, persevering. In fact, he's, he's saying the exact opposite of God will just give you whatever you want, right? Because he's saying that the whole parable is you're going to pray and right off the bat, you're not going to get what you want. The friend says no, doesn't he, right? Jesus is saying you're not going to immediately get the thing you're asking for. You need to be persistent. We might think, well, why? Why is God holding out on us? Is he, is he just making us work for it? Um, does, you know, does prayer only work if we say it enough times? Well, no. Remember, pagan prayer was about coercing, forcing the gods. But that's not what Christian prayer is. It's not about getting God to do what we want him to do. Prayer isn't about changing God. It's about changing us. And so the process of persistence, the process of working through these things in prayer, is to change us. As we daily, or hopefully many times a day, come to God in prayer, we are persisting in believing that he really is the only one who can help us. He really is the only one who can give us life. He really is the only one who can make sense of our lives. And so all of that belief and faith changes us and helps us to believe more and to believe more deeply and to trust him. Really, as we've said, haven't we, prayer is just walking daily with Jesus. So it might be that you have been persistently asking for, praying for, whatever it may be, a new house, new health, whatever it may be, for, for like a year now, yeah? And you might ask, why has God not given me what I asked for? But hopefully, God willing, in your persistency, you realise, as you pray for this every day, that actually, I've survived. I've survived each day. I've managed without that thing, whatever it is, that Jesus has provided for me and looked after me in other ways. And you realise that what has got you through this year, or whatever period of time it is, was not good health, was not a new house, was not uh, more wealth. It was Jesus. In fact, it was the very act of daily coming to Jesus. It was persisting with him and him persisting with us. Prayer is how we develop our relationship with God, how we draw close to him and trust him. Remember what we saw last week, in prayer we address God as Father, Father. And then Jesus really drives home this idea with a second parable about prayer. And he asks this kind of intentionally ridiculous question. And he says, what father among you, which of you, if his son asks for a fish, instead of giving him a fish, would give him a serpent, would give him a snake? Or if he asks for an egg, would give him a scorpion? And of course the answer is, none of you, right? No father would do that. And this is his point. If you can be good fathers, you who are not perfect, in fact you who are evil, how much better will the true father who is perfect be towards us? And so this first parable of the two men and the bread, that tells us that, it tells us that when we persist in prayer, God will answer by giving us what we need. But what is it? What is it that we need? What is the good thing he will give us? This second parable tells us that. And notice what Jesus says in, the se in this second half of this parable. Jesus doesn't say, um, what verse is it? Um, verse 13. He doesn't say, if you know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will the Heavenly Father give good gifts to 
to you who ask him. He doesn't say that. If the model, which, which is how it's often read and how we often think about it when we re recall this verse in our head. Because we're thinking if the model of a good father is someone who gives his children what they ask for, then God, who is the best father, will obviously always give us what we ask for. Especially if we ask persistently. That's not what it says. It's not what the Bible says. It says, if you then know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will the Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? The point of these two teachings, these two parables, is to teach us that if we pray persistently, God will often say no to the very thing we are asking for because he wants to give us something better. He wants to give you his Holy Spirit. And even if we wouldn't say this out loud, even to ourselves, never mind in front of other Christians, in our hearts, we might, want to be, we might want to pump the brakes and say, well, yes, obviously, the Holy Spirit is amazing. But he isn't like, you know, more important than having a house to live in, is he? Yeah, yeah, he is. But, but he surely, you know, I, I get it, nice idea, Doug, but, but in, re in the real world, right, like, it's not better than having a job and, and food on a plate, is he? Yeah. Yeah, he is. But, but surely my health and my happiness and my mental health and, and my marriage and my comfort, surely these things are, are actually in real life more pressing than receiving the Holy Spirit? No. They're really not. Okay, dear, well, 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 seriously, though, let's just be serious now. Well, what about my child? Surely my prayer for my child to be healed and healthy. Surely for my cancer to be removed. For my daily pain to be taken away. For my depression to be removed. Surely receiving the Holy Spirit can't be better than all of that. Yes, he is. He really is. God may say no to all of these persistent prayers. But when he does, he does, it, he does all of that to give us all of him. If he ever says no to these very legitimate prayers that we pray on a daily basis... It is all to give us the gift of the Holy Spirit that we may know and experience his presence in and through even these hard things. He may say no to health and job security. He may say no to your pay rise. He may even say no to prayer for the health and safety of the people you love most. But he will never say no to prayers for more of him. He will never say no to that prayer he will never say no to the one thing that we need to face all of these things him his presence with us his holy spirit the, the comforter when we persist in prayer he will give us the holy spirit he will draw close to us in whatever we are facing and that is truly far greater than the resolution of any circumstance Far greater than the provision of any physical needs and far greater than the ending of any temporal suffering. We may find that hard to believe, but that's why we have this preached to us, to help us believe. Because the thing is, when we receive the Holy Spirit, the person of God, we receive, what do we receive? Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. These are the things that God wants to give us when we persist in prayer. When we persist in prayer and seek God, he will draw close to us. 
And, and we begin to realize that all the things that we thought we wanted aren't really the things we need. And what we needed all along was him, was Jesus. So this teaching on prayer is not saying that God will eventually give you everything you ask for. It's really important we know that because that's, that's the sort of teaching you'll hear places and it will destroy people's faith. Because like, well, God hasn't given it to me. Maybe I'm not one of his children. No, no, don't, don't worry. He's given you himself, not all the riches of the earth. This is not saying that God will eventually give you everything you ask for if you just keep bugging him. It is saying God will give you everything you need and the process of prayer, the process of persisting in prayer, leads you to understand what that is. And leads you to understand that God is giving you what you actually need, even when he's not giving you what you want and what you've asked for. Persistence in prayer develops patience in us. It develops wisdom in us. It's not about getting God to give in. Prayer doesn't put God on our agenda. Prayer puts us on God's agenda. And so, as it comes to prayer, the question really is, how much do you want to change? How much do you want to be changed? How much do you want to be rid of that sin that plagues you? How desperate are you to build good, holy habits? How much do you really hate your sin and your temper and your instinct to judge other people and your lack of grace and patience with others? Are you persisting in prayer? Are you really, actually, daily, hourly drawing close to Jesus, asking him for his spirit? Prayer will change you. Jesus promises this when he says, seek and you will find. Verse 9. I tell you, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks, receives. And the one who seeks, finds. And to the one who knocks, it will be opened. This again, an incredibly abused verse. And again, it's so often used to support this idea that if you just persist in asking, you will definitely get it. Whatever it is. Ask for a house. Claim it in faith. And eventually you'll get it. Seek wealth and success and you will find it. Just have faith. But as usual, Jesus sees clearer and further and higher than we do. Like we read this and we do. We, we think of earthly temporal things a car money a job success but jesus is thinking bigger and fuller the promise is you will find what you are searching for so if the thing you want you think you really actually want what you're searching for is babylon life you will receive it if you are pursuing the treasures and pleasures of babylon if you read this passage you think great I can ask for more money, bigger house, better health, nicer car. Those are the things I really want. If you're pursuing the life of the world, that is what you will receive. You'll receive the life of this world, which is nothing and is, is passing. But if you want Jesus, if you want his kingdom, if that, if he is what you are searching for, the promise is you will find it. You will find him and you will receive him. Jesus promises you will find what you are looking for. You will receive what you really desire. It's an amazing promise. God is not hiding from you. He's near. He's right by you. At any moment, you can call out to him and you will find him. It also means there will be nobody in hell who searched for Jesus. There will be no one cut off from the living God for eternity who really wanted him. No, no, if you ever think, oh, I really want Jesus, but what if he doesn't want me? That's not a deal, that's not a thing. Or I really wanted Jesus, but maybe I didn't say the prayer in the right way. Or maybe I'm not a proper... Do you want Jesus? Are you searching him? Are you in church? Are you in prayer? Are you receiving the supper? Are you confessing your sins? Do you want him? He will not cast you away. You will find him. 
There'll be nobody in hell going, I really... There'll be no repentant people in hell. There'll be regretful, angry people, perhaps. But no one who was like, do you know what? I really wanted to know God. I really wanted the true and living God. I searched for him, but he hid from me. He rejected me and sent me here. No. You will find what you are looking for. We know the saying, don't we? Uh, Be careful what you wish for. You just might get it. Well, we can say, we need to be careful what we pray for, because you will get it. So what are you asking for when you pray? Are your prayers just a shopping list of things that you want? If your prayers are focused on asking for the pleasures and treasures and life of this world, even the health of this world, well, you just might get that stuff. You might. But it might be all you get. Just think for a moment, each, each of us. Let's think of our own lives for a moment. If there is regular money coming into our bank account every month, if there is a fairly solid enough roof over our head, if we have a general level of good health, and on the grand global scheme of things, we don't have any huge earthly woes. If our kind of worldly life is is working out in, in a general way, but we can't control our minds, our appetites and desires are out of control, we can't seem to get into a rhythm of Bible reading and a daily walking with Jesus, and there's sin we just can't seem to stop doing, maybe it's because we're getting what we're looking for. Maybe it's because we regularly pray for our earthly health, but seldom pray for our spiritual health. Maybe it's because we regularly pray for our earthly riches. Lord, provide what we need this week. But neglect to ask for heavenly treasures. Maybe it's because we daily pray for help with our work discipline, but forget to ask for help with our spiritual disciplines. How are we praying? Where are we focusing our own hearts and minds when we pray? What are we really seeking? Are we seeking for God and his way? Are we regularly in prayer to him? Or does an hour easily pass by without us speaking to him? And maybe you're thinking, Doug, do you know, I don't really know how else to pray. That's how I've always prayed. That's how I've always heard other people pray. Well, just try it. Throwing in different things every now and again, right? Pray for forgiveness. Pray for knowledge, for peace. Pray for faith. Pray for help with prayer. Ask God to help you to trust him through the trials of the day and the things that may come. Pray for him to be close to you. Ask for him to pour his Holy Spirit upon you. Pray for patience with other people. Pray for the power to defeat sin and resist temptation. And this is the big one. Just pray prayers of praise. I wonder how often we do that. How often do we just stop and praise God? Not as a response of something having just gone well. Not as a response of having just got something. But just stop in a moment to say, Oh Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. Thank you for being with me today, Jesus. Thank you for filling me with your spirit. How often do we just stop and just confess our sins? Just cry out, Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. You start praying like that regularly and watch how your life changes. Watch how the world literally changes around you as you seek Jesus and his kingdom. As you learn to see your day, not as a series of tasks that you have to do in order to get the stuff you want, but as an opportunity every moment to walk with Jesus, to trust him and seek him at work in your life. I just want to kind of finish and round up by telling you a story from the church from the 20th century. It's about a young boy called Costas. Costas, like any little boy, loved to run and climb trees and do all the things that that children do until he was diagnosed with a rare disease that meant he couldn't walk and he was bound to a wheelchair. 
Costas prayed ceaselessly for a miracle to happen. He prayed that he would be healed. And he was a well-loved child, and as he grew and became a young adult, and the whole town rallied around him to look after him. One person would come in the morning and help him get up and get dressed. Another person would prepare food for him. Other people would come and clean and read to him, give him his treatments. And, and really, the whole town gathered around Costas to look after him. And he would pass a lot of his time at church with them, with, and in the monastery where he would pray earnestly and persistently that the miracle would happen and that he'd be able to stand on his feet like he did when he was young. One day, an incredibly kind and, and wealthy man approached him and he offered to pay for Costas to go to America uh, to receive an experimental treatment to fix his legs, to m p maybe cure this disease. Costas was understandably filled with hope and he felt like his prayers just might have been heard and the big miracle was about to happen. But before he would go, he, he wanted to go and see, speak to his pastor to receive blessings and to receive prayer on his journey. And his pastor agreed to meet him the next morning, early in the morning, in the town square. And so the next, next day in the morning, Costas, together with a, a, a monk who brought him there accompanying him, waited for um, Father Paisios uh, to come. And he approached. He kneeled in front of Costas and he started patting his feet saying, little legs, little legs, these little legs, how many people they will lead to heaven. And he said, my child Costas, stand up so that we can take a walk. Costas is shocked, not because of the words of Father Paisios, but because he could feel for the first time after many years, his blood warming. This frozen blood, which all these years would not let him take a single step, now started warming. And with the help of Father Paisios, Costas st stands on his feet and starts walking around the square. He was crying and glorifying God all the time during his walk. Having made a circle of the town square, they reach his wheelchair again. And Father Paisios helps Costas to sit again in his wheelchair. And Costas immediately feels his blood freezing again and his whole body um, being dead again. He's saddened. He tries to understand why he has been confined to his wheelchair again. Father Paisios, without telling him anything, says, Do not go to America, go back home. Costas asks, Why? You saw me. I was walking. I was fine. Father Paisios replied, My child, we took this walk for you to understand how easy it is for God to make you well. But your condition will only get worse from here. God could easily make your legs well, but he is preparing a greater benefit for your soul and at the same time working the salvation of of all these people who look after you. They are not aware that they are walking to heaven with you. Stay here and don't go anywhere. These little broken legs, how many people they will lead to heaven. You and all those people who stand by your side to help you as one of the least of these. Kostas went back to his room and he lived more years than the doctors expected. He lived half a century and fell asleep at 52 years old. The people who saw him in his last moments spoke of a smile that was painted on his lips. He was satisfied with his earthly pain and restrictions because they were helping himself and others experience Jesus. God could make you better like that. Like that. He could make your child better. He could give you riches and wealth and ease. He could remove your suffering. He could grant all your prayers for this passing age. But he wants to give you something far better. He wants to give you heaven. He wants to give you himself. And he wants to give you the blessing of seeing others led to heaven. Even by your struggles and suffering. We may never have such a clear reminder as Kostas did. But by being persistent in prayer, 
By drawing close to Jesus, we can learn to see the world this way. Prayer is not for me, it's not for God to give me what I want, but for me to learn to want what God gives. We need to stop believing that God is like a vending machine in the sky that just dispenses goodness upon the earth impersonally and begin believing that he is the goodness poured out on the earth. He's not just there to give us stuff. There you go. Get, hopefully this will help you get through life. But he himself comes to us in his son Jesus, in the preaching of his word, in the sacraments, draws near to us and shows us the way through. He is the way. And through prayer we draw close to him and learn to live in his way. So how do you, how do you pray? What is your priority in prayer? Are your prayers merely about this world and your comfort now? Or are you praying to see God's kingdom come? Praying that you would make it to the end as a Christian. Praying that others would follow Jesus. Even if it, may be through, even if it is through the discomfort of our bodies or even poverty. What are you praying for? What are you looking for? Because whatever you are seeking, you will find it. Every moment is an opportunity for prayer. And every prayer is an opportunity to speak to Jesus and spend time with him. To be transported out of this grey world into the inexpressible glory of heaven. And so, why wouldn't we persist in prayer? How are we not praying in every moment. All glory be to Jesus. Amen.